Good morning. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church of Metuchen. For those of you uh, joining us today in the sanctuary and to those of you worshiping with us online this morning, we are so glad you're here. As we prepare for worship this morning, uh, we ask that you take time now to prepare yourself, silence your cell phone, if you will, so that we can be as present together in worship this morning as possible. We have just a few announcements as we begin. We have started another program year and we are excited to see our children and youth programs and choirs start anew. We hope you take some time this morning to go through the Sunday paper, the last few pages of the bulletin and don't miss out on any upcoming events. There are quite a few opportunities for study and learning coming up. A new monthly study begins today on Christology with Reverend Gary and Helen Burkakowski facilitating. This will be in the chapel after worship and after you grab your coffee and refreshments. The weekly pastoral Bible study starts this coming Wednesday and there will be two options to attend this study in the morning at 1030 or in the evening at 6 p.m. both in the Presbyterian Women Lounge. Uh, please choose the time that works best for you. Reverend Gary's book, The Pericopes of Luke, will be used for this study, and thanks to a very generous donor, you can have a copy for free. So please consider joining. We want to thank the Food Pantry for hosting today's after-worship refreshments, so please join them in room 109, just through this hallway, to enjoy all of the treats they have prepared for us today and chat with some of our Food Pantry volunteers. With that, I invite us to prepare our hearts and minds and rise for the call to worship. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall never be shaken. How long will you assail a person? Will you batter your victim, all of you, as you would a leaning wall, a tottering fence? Their only plan is to bring down a person of prominence. They take pleasure in falsehood. They bless with their mouths, but inwardly they curse. For God alone, my soul waits in silence, for my hope is from him. He alone is my rock, my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my deliverance and my honor. My mighty rock, my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us.
pause here at a time of confession to examine our lives, our temptations, and the ways we have fallen short before our God. Let us confess our sin together. The steadfast love of God endures forever. Our God is merciful and slow to anger. To obey is better than sacrifice. We know what is required to do justice, to love mercy, to walk humbly with our God. All of this we know and proclaim with ease when all is well. But in the swirl of confusion, in the time of trial, in the darkness that prevails, we forget. Forgive our fears and our flight from your house of prayer. Amen. Let us take a small moment of silence for personal confession. Friends, God hears our prayers, and by grace, we are forgiven. In spite of our selfishness, in spite of our stubbornness and arrogance, in spite of ourselves, God forgives us of our sin. Through the love and grace of Christ, know that you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. to invite friends to come forward. I see a couple here and there. Could you come forward? Thank you. Come on down this way. I'm going to try and do something here. Pray for me. Okay, there we go. Almost there. Almost there. Oof. See, this way we're eyeball to eyeball, right? Because I'm, I'm taller than you. Come on, sit down here with me. Everybody here? Okay. Now, sometimes after you go to Sunday school, we do stuff in the worship service that you don't know about. Like uh, most Sundays, we eat ice cream after you've left. <laughs> I'm joking, right? You know that. You know that. It's just cookies. So, but we're going to do something today that's called an ordination and installation. Big words. Can you want to say it with me one time? ordination and installation. What, is, what does that even mean? Well, I'll tell you what it means. It means that there's people out here who are going to promise to take care of the church, to take care of you and you and you, and they're going to do, do it in two ways. They're going to promise to take care of you as an elder. I know. That means they're really old or older than you. How about that? And then they're a deacon. Now, an elder is someone who makes sure that the, the lights are on and there's chairs in your Sunday school and there is uh, people here to make everything work, right? And a deacon is there if you get sick or you're... you're feeling sad or you're you're hungry like where's see mrs see mrs draper up here raise your hand what 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 do you help the deacons do what do you do she makes soup so if you get sick guess what soup but that's like a deacon ministry so these people here are going to promise to be an elder or a deacon now to be ordained means you come into an order and to be installed means you have a place in that, okay? So what I want us to do is pray for them before we do it. Because you know what? Sometimes being in charge 
it isn't all it's cracked up to be. So let's pray for them. Okay, together? Let's pray. Almighty and gracious God, help those today who are going to be elders or deacons. Help them to love you and love others in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, time for Sunday school. First scripture reading comes from the book of Proverbs. The plans of the mind belong to mortals, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All one's ways may be pure in one's own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit. Commit your work to the Lord, and your plans will be established. The Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. All those who are arrogant are an abomination to the Lord. Be assured they will not go unpunished. By loyalty and faithfulness, iniquity is atoned for, and by the fear of the Lord, one avoids evil. When the ways of people please the Lord, he causes even their enemies to be at peace with them. Better is a little with righteousness than large income with injustice. The human mind plans the way, but the Lord directs the steps. This is the word of the Lord.
what a great prayer. Amen. Our second lesson comes from the Gospel of Matthew. This is Matthew 27. Now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. So after they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to re release for you, Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? For he realized it was out of jealousy and envy that they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to Pilate, saying, Have nothing to do with that innocent man, for today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, then what should I do with Jesus, whom you call the Messiah? All of them said, let him be crucified. Then he asked, what, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. This is the word of the Lord. Please pray with me. Almighty and gracious God, help us to hear the words set forth in Scripture. Help us to know how to live it out and give us the strength to do so. Amen. From time to time, I will write a letter of recommendation. I count it a privilege, much like writing a, a funeral homily or a wedding reflection. It's a unique moment of privilege to step into someone's life and offer words of encouragement and praise. When I'm done writing the letters, I follow a practice of a seminary mentor. I give the completed letter in an unsealed envelope. And to the person I'm recommending, I say, this is your letter. Send it. Don't send it, it's up to you. But you should know what it says before you decide. This is what my mentor did. He gave me a letter of recommendation for a program, and, and it was sealed. I distinctly remember reading it. I, as I read it over, I welled up with tears, and then I sealed it, and I put it in the mail immediately. I only read it once 30 years ago. Looking back, there could have been times that letter proved handy. Uh, a dark day. Uh, I imagine it might have helped. Lifted me when I was down. Given me a boost. I don't remember what it said. I just remember how I felt. He spoke of me in ways that I simply didn't believe about myself, held me in esteem in ways I certainly didn't see, and thought I could do much more that even now I doubt. Again, I don't remember what he said exactly, but I remember this overwhelming sense of affirmation, of praise and confidence. He, he believed in me much more than I believed in myself, and I felt uplifted. To be honest, a, a part of me really wanted to dismiss this, say it was an exaggeration or, or a misunderstanding or a misplaced confidence. But as I sealed the envelope and put it in the mail, I thought, this man's really smart, much smarter than you'll ever be. He's wise, he, he's lived a lifetime and, and seen a great deal of the world and so on. Why would you doubt what he's saying? Well, I can think of a couple of reasons right off. There are two easy answers to that question. The first idea that flowed through my head was to doubt, doubting the veracity of his assessment because I hadn't lived enough life to have a true measure of what he saw in me. 
I was too young, naive, and inexperienced to look at life the way he looked at the world and looked at me. Just didn't have eyes to see. I, I, I doubted because I was not yet able to believe. The other source of doubt I possessed, why I balked at the letter, I believe, it, it, it's what I call the internal wiring of Protestantism. The legacy of Protestantism is that you and I have a wormy soul. This is Calvinism. I hate to tell you this, but you're, you're a wretch, a worthless sinner, uh, nothing personal, but you're born in guilt and shame and cursed. You deserve nothing but wrath. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, all have. But you know, us Protestants, us Presbyterians, we see this fall, this falling short, as falling really low. Complete depravity is the memo, okay? Hence, no praise, no blessing, no affirmation is deserved, trustworthy, accurate. Grace is a gift ever in spite of us. What we deserve is wrath. I confess that, that a part of me is glad. This view, wormy view of the soul, all humanity is depraved, is fading a bit today. Not the prevailing theory. We're less convinced today about the depravity of humankind, despite the horrors of the 20th century. We're gaining a much more positive perspective. And yet there's still something that lingers here, a, a deep sense that nags at many, a, a cloud of the 16th century that lingers over all of us. Not all the time, but sometimes for sure. We all struggle to believe, well, you know, don't we really just deserve wrath? And what's more, many struggle and don't believe we deserve to be loved. We, we deserve to be held in esteem. It's hard to believe. Now, if it happens, maybe we're lucky. Luck, luck is good. But a sense of deserving of love of grace, still a little too far. My favorite scene of Mark Twain is when Huckleberry Finn is being punished for something he didn't do. Huck chooses to accept the punishment, doesn't protest the unjust treatment. His rationale is that he's done so many other bad things and didn't get caught, that maybe this is fair. You know, a slight adjustment on his karmic balance sheet. Huck deserves some punishment, even though his punisher got the crime wrong. We all have this cosmic karmic balance sheet in us. You hear it when people say, I I'm trying to keep in the good, or to keep in good graces, or do more good than bad. Unlike Huck, I, I didn't add up all the praises of my mentor and say, well, I deserve it. I liked what he said and, and how it made me feel, but I struggled to trust this. Another part of the struggle is a bit more down to earth than the, the, the maturity question or theology question. The other part of this distrust comes down to baseball, the last great lesson of baseball. I grew up playing baseball, catch, pickle, three flies up, pick up games, little league. Baseball taught me many things, been very good to me, great lessons for life. But its last lesson is, is kind of a rite of passage. The actor George Clooney described this recently in an interview. Clooney was good enough to try out for the Cincinnati Reds as a young man. 
The first tryout didn't go well. But the next one, the next year, he made it to the level of consideration where you have a shot. He had a shot to be signed by the Reds until he got into the batter's box and faced a curveball pitched by a major leaguer. Clooney said he dove out of the batter's box as the ball broke across the plate. He said, I realized I was not going to be a professional baseball player. For me, it wasn't anywhere near that level when I got the memo. It was simply the moment when the pitches started coming fast, when the ball started to exceed 70 miles an hour, when the pitches were moving that fast. I wasn't looking to hit the ball. I was looking trying to not be hit by the ball. Recounting this recently to somebody, they they cut me off saying, oh, same, absolute fear. Wasn't going to happen. That's when I quit. Quitting baseball, or perhaps better said, quitting the notion that the majors was a possibility. Quitting this dream when you realize that there's no way I can hit that ball. It's moving too fast. Quitting at this point, it's a rite of passage, a passage beyond the grandiosity of childhood. All of a sudden, the luster of life is a bit dull. And the ladder you climb to glory, it's not yours. Yours is more of a footstool for reaching things in the garage. This last lesson of baseball is something that resurfaces when praise or acclaim or potential seems to be a stretch. How could I be thought of as worthy or owed such a shot when I can't hit a fastball, let alone a curve? There's a sense of not deserving such a shot. It's not for me. Not what I am. The idea of of getting what you deserve is at the heart of our reading today. Barabbas doesn't get what he deserves. He was lucky. Barabbas was lucky. The crowd chose him and not Jesus. This was not the act of God. It was luck. That Barabbas, the rioting bandit, would get another shot at life wasn't fate. It was fortune. He was lucky. The Pharisees worked the Jerusalem crowd into a frenzy. The people were deceived and misled to shout, crucify him at the one who healed the lame, fed the hungry, gave hope to the poor. Barabbas was like the criminal crucified with Jesus who spoke of deserving punishment. We deserve this, one crucified thief said to the other. No one would have blinked if Barabbas was crucified that day. I mean, we can debate capital punishment, but such was not the debate in Jerusalem the day Barabbas was set loose. Barabbas was lucky he didn't get what he deserved. I know some folks don't believe in luck. All right. Some folks have corrected me in conversations when I say things like, I was lucky. They make declarations about God and plans and purposes and making all things according to God's will and God's hand comes up and God's mind. There's often a bit of a concession offered by saying, it's not ours to know, we cannot know the mind of God, but we cannot doubt the reasons of the Almighty either. And then there's usually a flourish a declaration, I don't believe in luck. Most times I resist the temptation to say, how unlucky of you. (laughs) Most times I can resist this, but not always. Now, please don't half understand me. I don't believe all things are a matter of luck or fortune. No, There, there are things that are a matter of fate and destiny, events, where our lives are determined, not by the roll of the dice, 
but by the hand of God, the, the, the genetics we inherit, the choices others make, and even some we make. But not everything. There are moments and places and times and people that are not a matter of determination or purpose of God or anyone else. Some things are best left to Barabbas. Being given something you, you don't deserve because people made a bad choice and somebody gave you a new lease on life. Each year at this time, the last 21 years, we pause on 9-11. There are calls to never forget. People recount where they were, how they heard. Some were close by. Some were meant to be there that day, to be with all those who died. For those who recount how they made it out or were called away or they were just sick that day, there is what is called survivor's guilt. Why did I get to live and others did not? Any attempt to answer this question with words like purpose or plan or will of God all become hollow. At some point, destiny and fate fade away and you must accept with a sense of painful gratitude that you're alive and you have a chance to live while others do not. We all struggle here to, to answer how is it that I deserve this life, the more life others lost that day. I, I believe God does have a plan. I believe the destiny of the world is determined by God. I do. God chooses love, not wrath, for us. God gives mercy, not hatred, if we're willing and able to believe such is true. That's the plan. We, we struggle with this like the prodigal struggled with the grace offered to him upon his return. I don't deserve the robe. I don't deserve the ring. I don't deserve the kiss. I, I should be shunned. That's what I deserve. And those great words, the, the great choice of the Father in the parable, how can I not rejoice? You were dead and now you're alive. Somehow, you made it home, kid. I believe God has a plan for us when we open our hearts. The plan is to drive away fear, to bring us freedom where there was anger. On, on Tuesday, when the storm has passed, or because you turn right instead of turning left, that's not the plan. It's not part of a purpose. No. Life is filled with random rolls of the dice where sometimes we win and sometimes we lose. Events both beautiful and tragic where we're lucky or unlucky. That's not God's plan. Not God's choice. The game's not rigged. God's plan is that you live unto joy where we accept grace as deserved. Not earned, not owed, deserved. Because we are loved and lifted out of falsity. God's choice is to redeem creation with love, to make us deserving. Amen.
Please be seated. There are different gifts, but together we create one ministry. Within our common ministry, some are chosen for a particular work, ministers of the word, ruling elders, deacons. We ordain and install those for the next year this morning. When I call your name, please come forward. Christina Scolio, Brian Smith, Nikki Walter, Nancy Reagan, and Reynolds Shaw. Mr. Moderators, speaking for the people of the church, I bring Christina Scolio to be ordained as ruling elder, Brian Smith to be installed as ruling elder, Nikki Walter to be ordained as deacon, and Nancy, and Nancy Reagan and Reynolds Shaw to be installed as deacons. It's only the last one that I'm worried about. Me too. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna uh, ask you a series of questions and ask that you would respond with, um, I do. And they're all, they all should feel a little bit overwhelming if you've never done this before. If you've done it before, you know it, it all works out. <laughs> do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledge him Lord of the world and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do you? I do. Do you accept the scriptures, the Old and New Testament, to be by the Holy Spirit, the unique, universal, authoritative witness to Jesus Christ and the church universal, God's word to you? And do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? Will you? Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of the church as authentic and reliable exposition of what scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed by those and led by these confessions as you lead the people of God? Will you? Will you fulfill your ministry in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of scripture and be guided by our confessions? Will you? Will you be governed by a church's polity and abide by its discipline? Will you? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? Will you? Okay. Now here's the best ones. Will you in your own life seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, work for the reconciliation of the world, and will you pray and seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? Will you? I will. Okay. For the ruling elders, will you each be a faithful ruling elder, watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service? Will you share in the government and discipline of the church and councils and your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Will you? I will. For the deacons, will you be a faithful deacon, teaching charity, urging concern, directing people's help to the friendless and those in need? And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Will you? Mr. Rock, moderator, ruling elder Brian Smith, deacons Nancy Reagan and Reynolds Shaw, having been elected again to active service by the vote of this congregation, may now be installed to office. You've been called to a position of leadership in the church. You're already ordained. Do you welcome the work for which you've been chosen? I hope so after you just promised all that. <laughs> <laughs> Will you? Okay. Mr. Moderator, Christina Scolio and Brian Smith are elected to serve as trustees in the corporation of this church. We wish to recognize the responsibility they have accepted. Now this is big because if you don't answer this and you can't sign the documents of the bank, do, do, do you promise to be a good trustee? I do. I do. Okay. Yeah, I skipped over that. Yeah. 
for the convocation. Do we, members of the church, accept Christina and Brian as trustees, and do you promise to support them in their work for the church? Let us pray. Great and almighty God, we give you thanks for those that you have gathered here to serve you. Help each one to find you, to find you in the stranger, to find you in the old friend, to find you in children, to find you in those in the very last moments of life. Give them the strength and intelligence, imagination and energy to find you. We pray that you would ordain those to be ordained and install those to be installed so they may find you. Amen. For the congregation, do we, members of, this, of the church, accept these ruling elders and deacons, agree to encourage them to respect their decisions, and to follow as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is head of the church. The members of the church answer these questions in the affirmative. I now invite all elders and deacons in the congregation to come forward to pray over those elected to serve in the ordained ministries. If you'd like to come forward, you can. Let's pray. Almighty and gracious God, with the laying on of hands, we see and understand that your power has gone from you to these who are gathered here. We pray today that you would guide them, give them wisdom and strength and courage. Help them to understand that we follow you in humility and courage. We pray this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. supposed to say right now if the ushers are ready let them come
give you thanks for the gifts that have been given today. Search our hearts. Help us to have cheer in our giving. Search our hearts. Help us to trust that we only keep what we give away. I got so excited about that ordination installation thing. I'm completely lost. <laughs> so it turns out now we're going to share some peace. So I have peace. I'm going to give it to you. Peace be with you. Peace. Share the peace around. Peace. 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 Let us pray. God of the morning, God of the evening, you find us all day long. Find us now as we pray to you. We pray for our world. We lift up to you all the heaviness that comes with the destruction of flooding, earthquake, heat, and climate disaster. We pray for those affected by cyber terrorism and the violation that comes from online with no sense of humanity or decency. In this time when it is easy to hide behind the screen, we pray for those who harm and those who are harmed, never knowing by who or why. We pray for our community, for the families of those lost and hurt on 9-11. We pray for those in our midst who are facing upcoming surgeries and slow recoveries, new diagnoses, and ones that continue on. We're all living with illness and disease and those who are caretakers. There are many caretakers in our midst, from those who care for loved ones to those who care for us in this congregation. And this place we get to call a piece of life for us. We are grateful. And we are grateful for the joy we find around us, for our children, for those going into first grade, for bus stops and the rainbow of children in our neighborhoods, for the quiet of the empty nest and the noise of family that has come home. We pray for our church and for all who lead us in times of growth and in times of joy. We are grateful for the tireless efforts of Nancy Liardi, who is guiding so many of us here, the beautiful sound of the choir voices, and the way that our artistic expression shows a glimpse of God's vast creativity and beauty. We are thankful for every day we have on earth when and where we witness signs of life and love all around us. Let it inspire us to inspire others. Amen. Now we join together to say the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And let us not fall into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
want you to know that I didn't choose a word deserve lightly. It's a tough, tough word to feel like you deserve something, right? Trust the plan. Work the plan. God loves you and makes you that. Trust it. To that end, may the grace, love, and peace of Jesus Christ rest on you and guide you today and every day. Amen. Amen.